did you feel normal when, whenever you drank? Because whenever I drank, I, I didn't feel normal. Like, like I was looking away to other people and they seemed to be different. It seemed to affect me differently. Like, I was always thinking about inwardly, you know, and I had an alcoholic head. Uh, I would never have classified myself as normal. Um, probably still don't, to be honest. <coughs> no, I know what you're saying. Um, it was a one-track mind. You know, it was how far can we take this? Mm -hmm. You know, how far can I take this? Every scenario, you know, if it's a conversation that you're saying things that, you know, are outside of the uh, social norms or what's ex ex accepted, you know, that you're always pushing. You know, that was, that's what I always don't like, you know. Um, you're going to the extreme of everything and that's including how much you're drinking and wh what you're drinking. You know, you're pushing um, your limits, you're experimenting, can I do this, can I get away with this, sort of thing, like, do you know what I mean? So, no, it was, that's definitely not normal, like. Did you see yourself as, as always going to the extreme and with uh, drink as well? A hundred percent, though. Um, but I, and I used that, uh, uh, you know, people around me or whatever, and would have surrounded my, myself by like-minded um, people, the same sort of people, like, do you know what I mean? And then they became an excuse for he, she was doing it. Um, me too. If I have everybody's one, doing it. Do you if know I have I mean? one drink, I need, I need, I'll drink their fault, their fall over. Uh, I can't have one pint. No, definitely not. It was never enough. And even when I sat with twenty cans at my feet and a bottle of Morgan's based or whatever it was, that was never enough. You know, there was always a. You might have cracked one can and go. At some stage, I'm going to need more here. You know, this isn't going to last me. Mm. So and. You have 23 cans to go and a litre bottle or a 10 glass, but you're still worrying and anxious about this is going to run out. You know, you're not, you're always constantly looking ahead thinking, mm. where am I going to get more? Do I have enough money to get more? You know, that's maybe a day away. Do you know what I mean? You're probably going to pass out after these, but you're still worrying about it. Like, you're not actually enjoying yourself. Like, you know what I mean? You might be dancing, shouting and jumping about or whatever like you know but you're still worried about where's the next one coming from like i was always, that's right i was always worried about that the hangover coming down the line uh how am i gonna where's the next drink coming from because the dt's horrified me like. uh uh some awful awful experiences with it. like um the hangover didn't scare me because i always knew i was going for another drink you know socially acceptable to go for a cure as it's called, mm. which the cure just leads on to another mad one. Like, Ours you know, if you fall into uh, the, the company of somebody who's going to carry, and uh, I remember sitting in a bar um, up around Bishop Street, and there was an old boy, and he's a, he's a, a well known drinker, like, and I was in an absolute state. I mean, I was holding a pint, and I was like, out there, I could hardly hold it. Mm. And this boy says to me, you know, it was like pot kettle sort of thing, and, I, and you know, someone had me, even in that state, he says, Jesus, you're in a wild way, son. And I turned around, and it was like a, a reality sort of thing, and <laughs> you're you're saying that mm. to me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm sitting going, holy fuck, there's something that I need to do something, or there's something wrong, like this, has, this, this isn't normal, like, you know, when the man who is well renowned for drinking for decades or whatever, and is, is calling you, you're saying you're in a bad state, then you must be bad, like, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Similar experience where I needed a straw to drink a pint of gas because uh, I couldn't put it up to me. Right? Uh, what a uh, everywhere. Uh, yeah, I used to go on and lift the paper and I didn't know what I was doing. But talking to other people then, uh, down the line in recovery or whatever, says that the reason why you were doing that is because it was a, you were sending a, a subliminal message to people not to bother you. You know, you're looking at the paper, you're not even reading it sort of thing. It's mm -hmm. just a message you're sending out, don't don't talk to me sort of thing. I'm, I'm doing what I have to do to nurse myself back to mm -hmm. some sort of stability, like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's mad, like. Alright, uh, big thing, man. When did you feel you hit rock bottom? Oh, many times, to be honest. Uh, there's countless rock bottoms. A uh, voice is, voice uh, is, you have you've never been the rock bottom, you know. 
rock bottom is a place between Craig and on the ground there was called the city cemetery like and that was a profound sort of thing that I taught but it's almost it's almost I don't know you can take it two ways you can think that um, one way of looking at it is this can get worse you know before I die and which is true like you know never you can keep drinking it's never going to get better like um, but every time I had some sort of new low you know, I was always uh, smart enough, you know, to have me some thinking what's about me to go, Jesus, this is a new one, this is a new low here. You've sunk to a different level now, like. But it never, never actually spurred me on enough to do something about it. It, was, it wasn't as if I brushed it off. It was just, ah, uh, well, there was an acceptance there. Mm. And that was the scary thing. And, a, and it's a scary thing for a lot of people that they come to uh, an acceptance of this is my lot, this is who I am, this is who I was meant to be, you know, uh, you know, that's the, the scary, the hurtful thing that, you know, that you're inflicting upon yourself and the mindset is disgusting, it's rotten, it's poisonous, that this is who you are, this is the cards that you were dealt, so get on with it. Did and, you accept it? Oh, Jesus, I, and that, that, that was the bad thing, like, you know, Right, I'm an alcoholic, so I'll show you an alcoholic. You know, I'll be the best alcoholic that you've seen. I'll be the stereotypical singing and dancing and idiotic alcoholic. You know, and that's what was killing me inside. Like that, I had accepted something that I knew that I was a million times better than. You know, and that was the it was the shame and the guilt of it that was killing me. Like, you know, the accepting something that was far less than second best, do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and when you go down into that rabbit hole of, you know, it's hard to, hard to bring yourself back, they fight back mentally, they say, no, you're better than this. You have to pull yourself out of this. And mentally and physically, it's a very hard place to come back from. Uh, I still get, you know, pangs of, of shame uh, nine, nine years on. Those things come back to me uh, and, and like a cringe uh, and a, uh, like a shake my head. They say, they say, look back, but don't stare. Do you uh, experience them? Oh, big time. Places, people, things, smells, mm-hmm. music, songs, all of them remind you of, they take you back to a certain place and remind you of things that, think, that they'd already done or said. And, you're, and you know what's like? It's like a stab in the heart sort of thing, like, you know, Jesus, did I do it? Did I say it? It's... But that's, you know, yourself, and then recovery, you cannot linger on it. You, you make amends with the people that you done, done wrong to, and, you know, you have to move on. You know, it, so it slowly builds you. Ne- they never do it again sort of thing, mm. do you know what I mean? What about the off-license? I used to go to different <clears throat> off-licenses out of shame. Because I didn't want to go into the same one, did you? Did you? See, I was never a boy to drink in the house on my own. Oh. I was always a boy to go to the bar and, and find money from God knows where and would have begged, borrowed, or stole for, for it. Like, do you know what I mean? There was always. I would have went back to parties or whatever, like, do you know what I mean? And um, would have took drink home with me to nurse myself. But I know what you're saying. I mean, I, I would have took the back streets to get from wherever I was living to whatever bar. Ashamed to be seen. Do you know what I mean? And being in awful states that you can hardly walk. Do you know that mm. feeling that you're nearly taking up two sides of the street sort of thing? Like, you know, and you sober? Well, you think you know you're not full. You're not. You haven't had a drink yet. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's almost as, as your gate is gone, sort of thing. Mm. You're that. That was a scary thing for me. And then the throwing up started. Do you know what I mean? And you're walking from wherever you're living to get to the bar, and you're throwing up, and you need a drink. You know, it's awful, awful, way to love, like, do you know what I mean? And I don't know what possesses us to accept that as normal. Do you know what I mean? This is it. This is, it. This is how I love. But you did. Oh, hook, line and sinker. I thought this was the boy that God made me to be, like, mm. do you know what I mean? This is... And then all the pain that comes along with it then, like, you know, your parents and family watching this going, this boy's dying in front of their eyes, like, do you know what he doesn't even see it. He thinks he's having a whaley at time. Did they struggle with you also? I put them through hell, like, do you know what I mean? And 
becoming a liability, you know. And you know they they would have waited. They got to the stage where they they were waiting for the phone call. They say your son's dead, you know. He was found or whatever, because I it was I was chief dark cloud like. Do you know what I mean? When you were sitting around me, mm. I couldn't drink. I, I, you know, if I was invited to any family function or whatever, I had to, there was a promise there, an unwritten rule that you wouldn't be drinking at this time, like you know. So I was sitting there by my head, and everybody mm. else was sitting enjoying themselves or whatever. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And why are you not drinking? How you get that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like an incredible hug. You wouldn't like me be no, drinking, exactly. me. Do you know what I mean? What was the the start of the journey? The rehab. They, they not rehab, but they getting the change in your life. Uh, it was taking its toll, mentally and physically. Uh, getting sicker, <laughs> mentally and physically. Um, the self esteem and all the rest was at rock bottom. You know, it was, I know you had moved on to a, a state or a stage of detesting myself. I fucking hated the sight of myself. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Do you know, it's scumbag looking back at me. Mm -hmm. I, it haunts me, you know, the, the feelings that I had towards myself. I was now a danger to myself, like, you know, that I was inflicting, inflicting pain upon myself deliberately, you know, trying to hurt myself. By drinking mm -hmm. and and knowing what I was doing to myself, but continuing it, you know. Uh, and I says before that it takes a a while not to come back from that black hole, like do you know what I mean? But uh, it wasn't, you know. People very rarely get well the first time. Do you know? And it takes a couple of attempts or whatever, mm -hmm. like and. Uh, my in my mid twenties, I was homeless. Uh, my family, you know, it was like tough love sort of thing. Like, you know, we can't be enabling you anymore. You're using this place as a refuge sort of thing. They come back and eat all our food and bather on again. Just do what you did before, and then land back when you're scant and all the rest. So I think it was like a. Don't give on them, we'll see if this sort of brings them around. I ended up living with nuns in our ma. I think it was the same order of nuns as uh, Mother Teresa on the Cathedral Road. And uh, they took me to Medjugorje. It was a brilliant, brilliant place. But uh, I that was the first time that I'd. Because you were it was like a dormitory sort of thing. Mm. And they were with other alcoholics and get chatting to them or whatever and I think that might, that was the first I need to do something here do you know am I going to go from pillar to post I mean from this convent to another wet house or something like that like do you know what I mean and I'm saying oh Jesus pay time is this what do you know so I think I think it was 24 or something then or 25 maybe and uh, that was the first time that the I tried, really, like, and mm. was under just the AA and things like that, like, you know. Uh, after, I went to America and all after that, they, they work, and, um, you know, they ended up in other disaster, you know what I mean, but, uh, 2016 was the next time I really made a go at it, like, they, they get, they get help and ask for help and things like that. And so you got sober, Peter, and how's life now? Uh, a lot better, a million times better, a bad day of the days, still a hundred times better than a normal day then, uh, everybody, same as everybody else, still have things going on in life that um, test you and um, stress you, but um, you know when you, you go through that process of recovery and you learn, uh, the origins of where you were and what struggle that you came through and how resilient 
you must have been they persevere and they they come out the other side then you feel as if you can take anything on like you know but that's i think what people do is when they are confronted with a stressful situation or a scenario that um is hard to deal with then they equated they what they came through and go right well, this is not too bad i can i've come through worse do you know what i mean and uh I can do it again so that's the approach that I have in life that um, no one or nobody or any foreign entity or anything like that can put me through through any stress not advice but what if you wanted to say to somebody else Give them advice, what would you say? If they were struggling the way you were struggling with alcohol? You're good. You're a good person. They stop telling you yourself you're a bad person. You're not. Uh, one of the things in recovery that the boy says to us is they say under the mirror every morning. I'm good. I was always good. God made me good. <clears throat> Never accept second best. And you know, this isn't a fight. You know, a lot of people have this perception that uh, giving up drink is getting up every morning and putting the armor on and grabbing the shield and grabbing the sword and let's fight this demon like. It's not like that. That's it's it's about going to get. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's I've had enough. I'm not doing this anymore. You know what? This unbuilt thing of masculinity or alpha male or I don't know if it's an Irish thing or whatever. Like you know what? No surrender. Or, right, you, you know what? Talk. Aye, you know everything is. You hold it under your arm. Aye. Do you know what? You're balling it up, and it's so counterproductive. There's no progression going to be made. That um, there is no shame, and just saying, "Listen, I'm finished. I need a help. I need a helping hand. Is there any chance you could help me out here?" Mm -hmm. You know this this pride thing, this egotistical thing that um, I'll sort this myself. You can't. You can't do it on your own. No, and. The cemetery is full of people who thought they knew best, you know, and I'll do this on my own and I don't need anybody. That's <clears throat> the sooner you ask for help, the better. And that's all. Just mm. you're a good person. You're worth it. You're a worthwhile and valued member of society. And you deserve a lot better. <laughs>